Welcome back to Five Rounds. We are happy to be joined by the recently retired Mark Bocek. Mark, you made your uh, UFC or your mixed martial arts debut in 2004. How has MMA changed since you first started? No, it's changed a lot. It's uh, it's highly evolved since I started. Um, at the time I started, you know, we still had the individual backgrounds, but with you know minor cross training. The difference is now we're starting to see guys doing that type of cross training from a from a much earlier age. So the fields become extremely much more competitive. When you uh, uh, look back now at that era of your career, you were right there in that, those key formative years. Really, some may say one day that golden age of the UFC where you know, there's tons of fan interest, that the sport is figuring out kind of where it's going to be and what it's going to do. Uh, you've got to be proud of what you did in, in the time that you were fighting. Oh yeah, extremely happy to be part of, their, part of it from the beginning. It was a big part of it, you know, Dana, Frank, Lorenzo, uh, the early days right before the, you know, the acquisition of UFC. Uh, and you know, when still people didn't know about it, it was there was a little bit of a heyday there, but starting to get cleaned up with the weight classes and starting to really spark this kind of global, worldwide interest by you know multitude of type of fans. So it was, it was special to be part of it for sure. I think what's interesting is if uh, you follow your career, you have the chance to train at ATT and Team Quest and the TriStar Academy in, in Montreal. Uh, what did you gain from going to all those different places? Oh yeah, like you never. I was never a closed-minded person. I always wanted to uh, to seek out the best, you know. And, and we all know there's great teams all over the world. Um, you know, Team Quest, ATT, uh, Greg Jackson's TriStar, a few of the gyms that I I visited, and uh, you know they're all they're all top-tier gyms. They all have great trainers. And they all have. Uh, they all have really high level athletes and you know things have come such a long way from great gyms like say Militage Fighting Systems which is incredible but now you know you see guys like you know John Hackleman from the pit bringing his guys to ATT or you know you never know who's going to pop up at you know TriStar things like that so all these gyms are highly evolved and uh, all the champions from each of these gyms have the, you know, the, the financial opportunity to essentially bring in whatever is lacking as well. For any of our viewers who do not know, uh, Mark Bocek has come out talking about PEDs in mixed martial arts, saying that I think more athletes than we realize are on performance enhancing drugs. Uh, we've heard athletes in the past say that you know, the only way to compete with these guys is to get on it myself because you know these guys are sauce to the core, they're able to train longer, and because of that, they're able to have those performances. Is that something that you've seen in your travels that guys are forced to take this stuff? Yeah, unfortunately, you know, if you if you want to compete against someone on you know, let's say five different drugs, um, and, and you're not on any, it's it's going to be extremely extremely difficult. You know, uh, that that's all obvious. We all see that. Um, you know, so of course you want to win. You're going to do whatever it takes to win. So of course there's going to be uh, some temptation, which every every single athlete uh, goes through in the end. Um, you know, but in the end, uh, it, it is cheating. It sends the wrong message, and uh, you know, your body will end up paying for it in the end. And then, like a lot of these fighters, you're going to have to be on on testosterone replacement therapy for the rest of your life. And we've kind of talked about this in the past because, you know, when you first started watching mixed martial arts or no holds barred before it became mixed martial arts, I think a lot of these athletes didn't anticipate that MMA or the sport would get onto network television, that they'd be fighting in front of 55,000 people mm -hmm. in North America. It just, it didn't exist. So back then when all these guys were doing the things that they needed to because they were going down and fighting in Brazil and guys are gonna stomp on their head, they had to make sure that they're protected. Now that the, those same guys that helped build the sport are in, in 2014, it's like, okay, well, sure, you're changing the rules. I didn't know that this was a possibility. Uh, do you feel for those guys that helped build the sport and now we're in this, guys like Vitor Belfort who have the finger pointed at him all the time, yes. they're in this scenario that maybe they didn't anticipate. Uh, yeah, it's it's unfortunate, you know. A, a guy like Vitor, I'm, I'm a big fan, you know, big fan of Vitor Belfort. But, you know, in the end, the reality of it is he's he's almost 40 years old, like you know some of the other fighters. And this is a young man's sport, and you know it's going to be difficult to compete with these guys, uh, you know, these younger guys that you know wh whether on something or not do do have naturally higher levels, you know, due to age, due to mm -hmm. due to less uh, drug abuse or less uh, or less head trauma. Um, but if you see some recent photos of, uh, of Vitor, it doesn't exactly look the same. Right. Yeah. You know, so, so in that essence, uh, you know, we all know a TRT Vitor can potentially beat anybody. Uh, the, cur the current Vitor, 
Uh, I don't know about that for Weidman. You, yeah, yeah, I don't know. I mean, but that's an interesting thing too because people will now start talking. There's one thing, you walk into a gym and you say to a bodybuilder, well, man, you're looking a little small today, and they'll freak out and do more drugs. So mm -hmm. that the idea that the whole internet is saying, hey, Vitor, your neck looks skinny, that could really freak the poor man out. Sure. It's a weird scenario for all of these guys. I mean, you can't point fingers, but right. have you seen what Kung Lee looks like in his 40s a week out? I mean, I, it's certainly not pointing any fingers. Michael but, Bisping will certainly point fingers <laughs> yeah. at Kung Lee yeah. without question. Yeah, but you cannot do that because there's all different types of science and nutrition, but it's easy to say that five years ago, no man in his 40s looked like this, nor fought young professional athletes. Uh, very true. Uh, good point. <laughs> Uh, maybe they maybe they can do a super fight with Belfort in Brazil. Who knows? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now, now that uh, you've announced your retirement, uh, do you have goals for the future? Obviously, they, you do. Um, is mixed martial arts part of the part of the scheme? I was always a fan of this from the beginning. Always, you know, mid early '90s. I was I was watching this stuff. I was doing martial arts since I was a kid. Um, just like when I started doing jujitsu, the eventual goal was to, you know, was to one day when I'm prepared and cross-trained was to, to fight. You know, also another thing was to, you know, get into a gym later on. And, you know, we see a lot of gyms running around by, you know, not so credentialed guys and not doing so successful. So, uh, so I got some interesting things in store and, you know, hopefully try to, try to open a real, like, super gym, you know? Super cool. When, uh, another thing you re recently talked about, and people came down on you, like, for, you know, we're talking about women's MMA and its sort of mm. place around uh, sort of men's MMA and, and the, you know, the original view of what mixed martial arts was for men. And people that suddenly are saying that you don't like women's MMA, yes. but you were talking about the comparison of skill level and training level and putting the two side by side, right? Uh, yeah, people, people kind of misunderstood what I said exactly. All I was saying, uh, simply comparing the two, not saying one's better than the other. If we look at uh, boxing, no one talks about male boxers being female boxers or yeah, right. you know, male tennis players beating female tennis players. So what I'm trying to point out, I think we actually show more respect uh, for these females by not comparing them to the males, actually comparing them within themselves, having top 10 rankings uh, within themselves and not having males versus females fighting for the same uh, submission of the night. Um, I'm, I'm sure UFC could easily adjust to having uh, you know, male fight performances of the nights and uh, female ones as well because they're hard to compare because if you have someone on the undercard who arm locks someone and let's say right. Ronda so arm bars someone, that's very difficult to compete with. And you know, we look at the NBA and the WNBA and nobody tries right. to put them side no. by side and just because they're very different. I mean, the, the physical bodies of men and women yes. are different, the experience level, how uh, long that, I mean, we were talking off camera about Sarah McMahon fought a, an eight no girl this weekend, that's but right. she didn't compete in the Olympics. So the, the comparison level of skill is much different than today's mixed martial arts where almost every guy is reaching the same level. Uh, yeah, true. The, the women's MMA talent pool isn't as evolved. It's kind of more like the men's was, you know, 10, 10 15 years ago. It's, it's not as evolved. Sarah's a really tough fighter. She's evolved herself. Yeah, like you saw, the other female, she, for a female, she's pretty good. She's never lost yet. She's 8-0. Um, you know, Sarah with a loss, but, you know, in the UFC, couldn't really, couldn't really compete with Mann. And yeah, McMahon's still young in her career. She's getting better. And with the current talent pool, I could, I could see her getting another title shot down the road. And uh, we got a, that's a perfect segue because I would not be surprised if with a victory, Benson Henderson earned himself another crack at the lightweight title, taking on Rafael Dos Anjos, who's been looking really, really good as of late. Uh, ben Henderson is one of these guys. Mark, you face both of these gentlemen. Yeah. Uh, ben Henderson is one of these individuals that convinces the judges that he's won the fight. And I think there's a lot of times where, you know, a professional mixed martial artists, casual viewers at home, felt that he did not earn, earn the victory, whether it was against Frankie Edgar or Josh Thompson. What is it about his style that can sway people? Uh, yeah, he's, uh, he's, an, he's a very big for the weight class. You know, he has a lot of muscle. He's a very intimidating individual. Uh, so, so when he performs any, any of his techniques, he, he may not perform them to the same volume as, you know, let's say his opponent. Uh, but because he's so athletically, uh, talented whenever he does it it's ex it's extremely explosive so that tends to kind of stay in judges minds brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt mark bochak when we come back robin tells us all about the joe rogan experience here on five rounds